Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Sally Bode. And I'm Li Jianhua. Our top stories. China's China. president urges deeper cooperation with Arab countries and calls for an end to the conflict in Gaza as he opens the China-Arab States Cooperation Forum in Beijing. Street battles and airstrikes continue in Rafa, where hundreds of thousands of Palestinians are sheltering. Early results in South Africa indicates the ruling ANC may lose their majority for the first time in 30 years. Less growth than previously thought, as first quarter U.S. GDP figures are revised down. China unveils a plan to reduce carbon emissions with a major push towards more renewable energy sources. And the newest members of Madrid Zoo get a royal welcome. Jin Qi and Zhu Yu made their first public appearance. China's President Xi Jinping has called for deeper cooperation between China and Arab countries. He also reiterated support for an independent Palestinian state. She made the remarks at the opening of the China-Arab States Cooperation Forum in Beijing, where several Arab leaders are attending. Our correspondent Chen Ziyuan has more. China will explore cooperation with Arab states in five fields, innovation, financial investment, energy cooperation, trade and people-to-people -people exchanges. This was among the key messages from Chinese President Xi Jinping's keynote speech at Thursday's opening ceremony of the 10th Ministerial Conference of the China Arab States Cooperation Forum. It has been two decades since the establishment of the forum, yielding fruitful outcomes with 19 mechanisms established through dialogues and forums, and releasing 85 documents. President Xi said the Middle East is a place for development, but it has been threatened by war. China supports Palestine in becoming an official member state of the United Nations and offers another 500 million yuan, about 68 million U.S. dollars. This is in addition to the 100 million yuan humanitarian assistance for Gaza's reconstruction and humanitarian relief. King Hamad of Bahrain, Egyptian President al-Sisi, Tunisian President Said, President Mohammed of the United Arab Emirates, and Secretary General of the Arab League Gaid also delivered speeches. President Xi Jinping announced China will be hosting the China Arab State Summit in 2026. Chinese President Xi Jinping said friends are like rays of sunshine, and China wants to uphold close friendship with Arab countries for a brighter future for cooperation. He said the world needs more dialogue and less confrontation, more tolerance and less estrangement. Peace, sincerity, integrity and tolerance are the common pursuits of China-Arab relations. President Xi believed China-Arab countries will be a major example of exploring the career path of global governance. Sun Ziyuan, CGTN, Beijing. China remains the largest trading partner of Arab countries. Over the last 20 years, trade has risen from $37 billion to almost $400 billion last year. China and Arab countries have increased cooperation in energy, finance and infrastructure. China continues to rely heavily on Arab oil. Last year, it imported 265 million tons of crude oil from the region. That's nearly half of all of China's overseas oil imports. And over 20 members of the Arab League have signed cooperation agreements to join China's Belt and Road Initiative. For more, let's speak now to Hussein Haridi, who's Egypt's former assistant foreign minister. Good day, Tune. Thanks so much for joining us. Talk to us about the significance of this China-Arab States Cooperation Forum. Well, of course, Egypt and the Arab countries do, of course, value uh, cooperation with with China that dates back to uh, decades, and uh, in a changing world, uh, I guess the Arab countries are looking forward to deepening this cooperation, and 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 they believe, and rightly so, that the uh, Arab Chinese uh, forum is uh, a good venue and a good mechanism to discuss uh, the ways and means 
of deepening this cooperation between the two the two sides. Of course, you have mentioned various fields like infrastructure, energy, uh, the uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Of course, these are very, very promising uh, projects, but I guess we, 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 we have to look to the future and, and, and see what the needs of the Arab countries are in the next uh, two or three decades in terms of uh, economic uh, development. Having said that, of course, this forum, uh, uh, this forum takes place in the context of the uh, war uh, going on in, in, in Gaza. And of course, the uh, remarks by uh, Chinese President, President Xi Jinping, uh, concerning Chinese support uh, to uh, the state, two-state solution, uh, Palestine and Israel living side by side in internationally recognized borders is welcome. And we, uh, we depend, I guess we, we rely, we, we hope that the Chinese support for the two-state solution would really uh, make a difference in the uh, foreseeable future. Because once this war is over in Gaza, then we have to look to the political horizon mm. of how to bring about this two-state solution. So we, we cherish, we value cooperation with China. We value Ch Chinese contribution to uh, to uh, economic development in uh, in Africa, in in the Arab world, whether in North Africa or in in, in Mashriq and and the Gulf area. And as you rightly said, the uh, uh, the uh, volume of trade between the two sides uh, has increased. And and of course, the reason is that of course that China depends uh, to a great extent on, mm. on its oil imports from the Gulf region. Yes. But we, we are hopeful. We are hopeful that the future carries, carries, carries really advantages and benefits for both sides. Yeah. And, you know, President Xi Jinping actually emphasized cooperation in oil, gas and renewable energy sectors. Of course, this is against that context that you mentioned um, of further instability, what's going on in Gaza is impacting everything. And this is a problem. How do we do good business without solving these geopolitical issues first? Um, luckily, luckily, uh, luckily, despite the instability, the insecurity, not only uh, after October 7th, 2023, but before that, uh, uh, luckily, Madam, cooperation hasn't suffered a lot. But of course, if I put it differently, uh, uh, with stability, security, peace in the, in, in the Middle East, uh, uh, after the uh, achievement of the two-state solution, I guess the, the prospects are brighter for deeper cooperation, not only with China, but with, with major Asian uh, powers. But as I said earlier, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, we believe that the sky is the limit as far as cooperation with China is concerned, and I agree with you that once uh, security and stability are restored in the Middle East, then uh, we would see more cooperation, not only in traditional fields, but in other fields also. And how important is China's role and positioning supporting the two states solution? We are hearing growing support, uh, countries increasingly recognizing Palestine. At the end of the day, what sort of difference does that me make? Well, the, uh, the latest recognition by four European countries, uh, Ireland, Norway, Spain, and today we received the good news that Slovenia uh, is on its way of recognizing the state of Palestine. This is, of course, gives a moral boost to the Palestinians under the present circumstances and keep the two-state solution alive. Because we are afraid, we are afraid some extremist elements in Israel are trying uh, to nip in the bud the idea of, state, of a, a two-state solution. So when, when countries, European countries, come, come and, 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 and recognize the state of Palestine, that definitely uh, keeps the, uh, uh, this, this notion, this concept, this idea of a two-state solution alive and and as, as as the spanish prime minister has rightly said when announcing the recognition of the state palestine by 
the Spanish government. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for uh, your insights there. Of course, that's Hussein Hariri. He's Egypt's former assistant foreign minister, distressing the importance of managing geopolitical tensions while you're trying to do good business. Well, Italy's foreign minister has said any weapons his country has supplied to Ukraine should not be used on Russian territory. Since Russia's cross-border offensive into Ukraine's northeastern Kharkiv region, President Vladimir Zelensky has been putting pressure on his Western allies to allow Kiev to use weapons to strike military bases inside Russia. Spain's parliament has given final approval to a controversial Catalan amnesty law. This ends all legal action against hundreds of separatists involved in the failed 2017 secession bid. The bill passed by just five votes. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez offered Catalan separatist parties amnesty in return for their support in forming a government, something his opponents widely criticised. China has pushed back against the criticism over the conviction of 14 people in Hong Kong for breaching the national security law. The Hong Kong court has ruled that they are guilty of subversion. They were among the 47 people who were arrested and charged for organizing or participating in an unofficial election in 2021. Critics say such moves undermine freedom and democracy. China's foreign ministry says it's opposed to any attempts to undermine Hong Kong's rule of law. A mayoral candidate in western Mexico has been murdered at his closing campaign event ahead of the elections. Alfredo Cabrera was about to address supporters when he was shot in the head. Now, the killing came on the final day of the most violent election campaign in Mexico's recent history. Mexicans will vote this weekend. Opinion polls show Claudia Scheinbaum, the former mayor of Mexico City, is on course to become the country's first ever female president. You're watching CGTN Steel Ahead. Following in the footsteps of Ireland, Spain and Norway, Slovenia moves to recognize its Palestinian state. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos and unicorn companies. Make sense of it all with global business only on CGTF. I think it should be more global cooperation. I would like to hear more the voice of the developing countries. Globalization has lifted more than a billion people out of poverty. The green transition has to happen. It's, it's, it's a necessity. For China and, and the United States are, are important powers in the world. What unites us is much more than what uh, divides us. And I believe China is committed to this agenda. Join me, Juliet Mann, to set the agenda at these times every weekend on CPTN. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more. Just got to be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why? This is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Hello and welcome back to Global Business Europe. Israeli forces have seized a key buffer zone between Gaza and Egypt, which means Israel now controls the entire land border of Gaza. The Philadelphia Corridor is 14 kilometers long and runs along the southern edge of the Gaza Strip. Israel says the area was used by Hamas to smuggle weapons through tunnels from Egypt. Cairo refutes those claims, adding to simmering tensions between Israel and Egypt. 
Let's talk to our correspondent, Jonathan Regev, in Tel Aviv. Hello, Jonathan. So what does all this mean for Israel's operation in Gaza? It basically means that Israel has now uh, stopped uh, every possible mean of smuggling, especially of weapons, from Egypt into Israel. It happened, it began last week as Israel took over the Rafa crossing through which uh, uh, Hamas could have uh, smuggled uh, things above the ground and now taking over the Philadelphia corridor, Israel can inspect what happens under the ground and in a press conference last night, uh, IDF spokesperson uh, Rear Admiral Daniel Agari stated that the IDF found at least 20 tunnels along the Philadelphia corridor, some of them actually crossing into uh, in, in to Egypt, meaning uh, they could have been used up until just a few days ago to smuggle weapons from Egypt into Israel. That is why Hamas, despite all the military pressure, had a constant fresh flow of ammunition from Egypt into Israel. Once Israel is able to, 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 to contain that, to stop that, it means that Hamas will have a much, much harder time smuggling weapons from uh, Egypt into the Gaza Strip, which was the main uh, the main way, the main uh, uh, line, let's call it this way, of smuggling weapons into Gaza. Is there growing concern from Israeli officials about potentially escalating tension with Egypt? Absolutely. We know that the Egyptians are not very happy with the operation in Rafah, which is right on their doorstep. The, the Rafah crossing is, is right between Gaza and uh, Egypt. And uh, Israeli and Egyptian officials are constantly in talks trying to contain that tension because let's remember the peace treaty between the two countries, which was signed some 45 years ago, 1979, is a strategic achievement for both countries. It is extremely important, both for Israel and for Egypt. And that is why high uh, official levels, high official, uh, um, of, high, high level officials are in constant talks uh, uh, to make sure that the peace treaty uh, remains so. But having said that, uh, what happens uh, on the Rafa, uh, on the Rafa border crossing in the Philadelphia corridor, which is right on the Egyptian doorstep, is concerning for Egypt. On the other hand, Israeli officials, unnamed officials, we have to say, never going public, are saying that it's impossible that Egypt did not know about all these tunnels crossing from Egypt into Gaza, that Egypt did not know about the rocket launchers, which were located just meters away from the Rafah crossing, but at least above, uh, above the ground, Israel and Egypt are trying to contain uh, every, every kind of tension because these relations, as we said, are very important for both countries. All right, thank you so much. That update from Tel Aviv, from our correspondent, Jonathan Regev. Meanwhile, fierce street battles and Israeli military bombardments continue in Rafah, where Gaza health authorities say nearly 40 Palestinians have been killed in 24 hours. Our correspondent Akram El Satri is in central Gaza. The total number of people killed in the last 24 hours is 54 Palestinians while the fighting in Rafah intensifies as the Israeli occupation forces are trying to push harder into the Tal Sultan area in an attempt to just surround Rafah, surround Al Shabura, heavily populated area in Rafah, the heaviest populated area in Rafah for the sake of just fully controlling the area. The troops have been advancing to advancing towards Tal Sultan to the very west of Rafah and have been trying also to move towards the uh, southern, uh, the northern part of Rafah for the sake of just fully controlling the city. The news about the bombardment has been here throughout the whole Gaza Strip. The news and the number of people who are killed is increasing because of the intensified bombardment that has been taking place in those different areas. According to the Palestinian Palestinian Red Crescent Society, around three staff of the Palestinian Red Crescent Society were killed in an airstrike that took their lives, and also some others were killed. Those people were coordinating the, uh, the uh, rescue services, and they themselves were killed by the Israeli troops. The situation continues to be very, uh, very dire. The uh, Israeli troops are still operating in the Rafah East area, 
Rafah West area, Rafah Central area, and they are moving towards the end of Rafah where they are fully surrounding the area. And with that comes the bigger bombardment, the destruction of full residential blocks, and also the quadcopter activity that has been dropping bombs on the people and shooting at them. So the situation continues to be extremely dire, and the Israeli troops intensifying their bombardment and their attempts to control the full area of the city, and the Palestinians are fighting, Palestinian factions are fighting, and there were some reports from the Palestinian factions about killing Israeli soldiers, targeting engineering squads, and targeting armored vehicles and other type of vehicles that are used by the Israeli army in that operation. Akram al sashari in Gaza. Now, Amr Musa is the former Egyptian foreign minister as well as the former secretary general of the Arab League. He spoke to us about Israel's control over the Philadelphia Corridor and what that could mean for the 1979 peace accord between the two countries. Uh, Israel came back or changed its policy uh, from just blocking, uh, encircling the uh, Gaza sector into directly occupying that uh, sector. Therefore, it is a military occupation that brings both West Bank and uh, Gaza straight forward. It is a military occupation. We have to deal with that from that point. Slovenia has become the latest European country to move towards recognizing an independent Palestinian state. This follows Spain, Ireland and Norway who formalized their recognition of Palestine this week. Our correspondent Yolo Abdavid joins us now. Hi Yolo, thanks so much for joining us. So we're seeing Slovenia move uh, to recognize Palestine. Is it as significant as the three other countries in Europe? It probably is because it follows a trend now by uh, about 11 of the European Union countries which have traditionally been seen as being supportive of Israel, supportive of Israel's right to, to have a state. But now, by recognizing the state of Palestine, Palestine I think it is uh, quite significant. I think the response from the Israelis uh, shows that. Uh, we had um, Israel Katz, the uh, foreign minister, and he you know, was quite unequivocal saying, well, this shows that the Palestinian state, by recognizing the Palestinian state, it rewards Hamas for murder, rape, mutilation, and so on. So I think that shows the depth of feeling. And it follows, of course, what's already been done with, with Spain and Ireland and Norway. But let's hear, first of all, from the Slovenian Prime Minister, uh, Robert Golub. Today, the government has made a decision to recognize the state of Palestine as an independent and sovereign state within the boundaries set by the United Nations resolution. <laughs> The decision has one message to all parties. We want an immediate cessation of hostilities and that we want an immediate and unconditional release of the hostages. And I think that's the reason why Slovenia, like the other countries, have now decided enough is enough in the eighth month of this conflict between uh, Hamas uh, and Israel and the impact on the people of, of Palestine. That's why I think they've decided they can't wait anymore. Uh, and, and he went on to say that there are other issues, that this is a message he claims for peace uh, to both sides and what there really needs to be is a, is a ceasefire. Yeah, Yolo, so this is the fourth country to do so in a week. So what's the reaction from Israel? Uh, well, you had a flavor of it, the, the strong tone, uh, totally undiplomatic from Israel Katz as foreign minister. But of course, remember, there is an inner cabinet, a war cabinet in Israel, which is just focusing uh, on what happens, as we heard along that uh, Rafa and, and Egypt border at the moment. But I think on a wider level, the Israelis know that while more and more countries now are recognizing, even though it may seem, well, what are they actually recognizing? Because Gaza has been under the cosh for so long, so hard in the last eight months, and the West Bank is still divided as well in terms of military control by the Israelis. So, but it does mean that there is a strength of attitude towards humanitarian help for those who need it in Gaza. There is also um, 
a, a trend with, with more and more Western countries recognizing Palestine. I think that is, is, is important. And it almost becomes a de facto reality the more people and the more countries recognize it. This still has to go to the, to the parliament of Slovenia, but probably, like Spain, like Ireland, uh, and like Norway, it will be recognized. And I think that will put more pressure on possibly Malta, possibly Britain, possibly other countries to follow suit. There possibly there will be more countries following suit. That is our correspondent, Yola Abdavis. Thank you very much. South Africa is on the verge of the most dramatic political shift since apartheid ended in 1994. Vote counting is still underway after yesterday's general election, but early projections show the governing ANC could be about to lose its majority for the first time in 30 years. Now, if that happens, the ANC will have to look to rival parties to form a coalition government. CGTN's Sumitra Naidu reports from Johannesburg. Vote counting started in the early hours of this morning, but it didn't come without any delays. There were some serious delays overnight, people standing in long queues till the early hours of this morning. There was a bit of an issue with the IEC getting enough equipment to these voting stations where people stood for many hours. Apart from that, everything else went smoothly. Most stations across the country closed at 9 p.m. And as I said, voting, uh, vote counting started in the early hours of this morning. We got about 17 percent, about a third of uh, the votes counted already and some very interesting numbers coming through. These numbers will continue to come in throughout the day and of course we're looking at you know, this election and the, and the numbers are really going to be the deciding factors on whether the ANC is going to lose its outright majority to run the next government or whether it will have to form a coalition government. Smitra Nadu, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Well, from one election to another, coming up next week, could the European Parliament be about to swing to the right. That's one of the key questions ahead of those elections. Well, this week we are looking at some of the big names linked to the different political groups in Parliament. And the European People's Party, or EPP, is the biggest bloc, holding nearly 180 of the 705 seats to form a majority. It has partners in Parliament made up of mostly liberal and socialist parties, but there is a growing speculation that it will team up with far-right groups after the election. Ursula von der Leyen is the EPP's lead candidate for commission president. The German has been in charge of the EU's executive arm for five years, something she's using to her advantage in this campaign, as CGTN's Michael Marulia explains. Ursula von der Leyen is at the center of European politics. She's had to tackle critical issues during her time as president of the European Commission. First of all, the COVID pandemic, then the conflict in Ukraine, and of course, a cost of living crisis. She's used social media to remind people of her experience and expertise. Her key message, I am standing with all of my experience and determination for a strong Europe. Now, Russia's conflict with Ukraine began less than three years after she was chosen as president. She's made security a big part of her campaign, saying she'll boost Europe's ability to manufacture weapons and promote common defense projects. Her message here, vote for a strong Europe that dares to act. She's also made youth a focus during her tenure, leading a program looking at the future of young Europeans. This video from her campaign shows young people from across the continent urging others to vote. This kind of content sends a clear message, saying to voters, I hear you, I understand you. Now, we've seen a lot of this in the build-up to the election. Posts like this, where she's meeting with a young content creator in Prague. Or this video, where she's talking to young Italians. Her message... Young people are the strongest supporters of the EU as we know it. And that really sums up her social media strategy. She's saying, I've got the credentials, my party knows what it's doing, we're in touch with the people, and we can change Europe for the better. The question is, 
will voters buy that argument? Well, let's get more on Ursula von der Leyen with Peter Oliver, who is just outside Berlin. Hello, Peter. So there's talk that von der Leyen will try to partner oh, yeah. with members of the ECR, for example, Brothers of Italy. Some of these parties described as far right. What could that mean for the EPP's policies and von der Leyen herself? Well, this is all part of the wonderful workings of electing a European Commission president, which isn't elected by the people. It's elected by the people the people elect. So uh, basically what Ursula von der Leyen is doing is uh, what she's done throughout her career, and that's gauge the political weather and which direction it's blowing in. In order for her to get elected as the, the uh, European Commission president, she needs members of the European Parliament to vote for her, and um, the parties that look like they're likely to gain uh, more members this time around are those on the right. It is worth noting that the ECR uh, are right wing, but they're not the ID grouping. That's the one that contains the really far right nationalists and Eurosceptics as well. Uh, ECR contains, as you said, Giorgio Maloney's Brothers of Italy party, a, a group that the established parties, the status quo, if you will, including the CDU, which is uh, Ursula von der Leyen's party here in Germany, have done plenty of business with in the past. Um, they're likely to do more business, and they're likely to be happy to do that business as well. Some may hold their nose a little at some within the ECR, but particularly when it comes to the likes of Brothers of Italy, they will do that business nonetheless, because they want Ursula von der Leyen, the EPP candidate, to be the next president of the European Commission, or to remain president of the European Commission, and the only way she does that is by getting the votes. It does, however, and what we have heard from the German Greens is, is that if there's any deal with the ECR, they will not be part of casting their vote for Ursula von der Leyen. However, what she's done in the past and what she's done throughout her career is spot which way the wind is blowing. And if she thinks it's blowing towards votes going towards the ECR, she'll definitely be making that deal, no matter what it does to her relationship with the Greens. Thank you so much, Peter Oliver, coming to us just outside Berlin. You can get highlights from the week's news in Europe and China direct to your inbox from CGT and Storyboard email newsletter. Sign up at europe.cgtn.com slash newsletter. Coming up on CGTN, Australia investigates an alleged ticket master hack. It could have stolen data from over half a billion customers. What do we mean when we talk about the difference? Brazen acts. The difference is in the detail, in the background, defense ministers from the wider angle and perspective of every story, wherever the story may be. CGTN. See the difference.
Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Sally Burdis and Li Jianhua. The headlines begin. China's president urges deeper cooperation with Arab countries and calls for an end to the conflict in Gaza as he opens the China Arab States Cooperation Forum in Beijing. Street battles and airstrikes continue in Rafah, where hundreds of thousands of Palestinians are sheltering. The latest figures show the U.S. economy grew at a slower pace in the first three months of the year. GDP was up just 1.3 percent, falling short of analyst expectations. Now let's go live to John Terrett in New York. John, great to see you there. So GDP yes. has been revised downward, 0.3 percent lower. I know. I know. Well, you know what GDP is, don't you? Gross domestic product. And what it actually is, is everything that America produces, and I mean everything, all tossed into one big bowl, given a great big stir, and out comes the GDP number, or activity. Economists call it activity. In other words, what activity did America get up to in the first three months of the year, January, February, and March? And when it came out on the 25th of April, it was a bit of a surprise. It was 1.6 percent. And we've been told to expect much more than that and then now today they always have a little revision and they'll probably have another revision as well in a couple of weeks time but the second look at it the first revision as it were came out a couple of hours ago and it was even less than we thought last time around so we were told 1.6 percent in april now we're told 1.3 percent consumer spending lowered personal consumption lowered and you would think wouldn't you that, that would buoy the markets as they say here buoy the markets because everyone's hoping for an interest rate card to stave off any slowdown or recession that might come in the future and clearly things are slowing down as far as GDP is concerned but no 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 the markets are still deep in the doldrums here and that is because tomorrow Friday we have the Federal Reserve's favored measure of inflation it's called PCE stands for personal consumption and expenditure and that is overhanging everything at the moment plus the fact the markets are fretting now that there won't be an interest rate cut before the whole of 2024 is out so they're rather panicking about that and we do have further confirmation John Williams not the composer, but the president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, John Williams, has been speaking in the last 15, 20 minutes, talking about interest rates staying higher for longer and saying that basically inflation is likely to stabilize in the second half of next year, 2025. And then on top of that, there was something very complicated called a Treasury auction on Wednesday and Tuesday. Basically, the Treasury was trying to sell bonds and nobody turned up because they're all expecting interest rates to be higher for longer. And then on top of all of that today, we have Salesforce, which is a major Dow Jones component. This company is a new and thought to be exciting company of the future that helps other companies to improve their business through the use of data and Salesforce is being absolutely hammered. I've never seen anything like it. Shares are down 20% now. This is because they revealed yesterday that fewer people are turning up or signing up to use their services in the future. So Salesforce is being hammered. And look at the effect on the Dow Jones. Now, the Dow at the moment is down by eight tenths of one percent, 300 points. But pretty much all of those 300 points are Salesforce. So without Salesforce is bad news, maybe we've been in the green. The S&P 500 at the moment is down by about a quarter of 1%, and the 10-year yield has fallen from its high yesterday, where it was approaching 5%. Well, John, today Democrats in the Senate are pushing for a probe into allegations of possible collusion by some of the big oil giants. What does yes. it mean? What will happen next? I know. I do you remember Dallas, the TV program in the 1980s. You probably don't, but it was the biggest TV show <laughs> on earth, starring J.R. and evil oil tycoon and Miss Ellen and Bobby and Pammy. Oh, it was just a great show. Everybody loved it. And it was about an oil tycoon. And this story is about an oil tycoon as well. Because what's happened here today, Thursday, Democrats in the House and the Senate in Washington, D.C., are calling on the Department of Justice to probe big oil. All the big names that you know and love, like Chevron and Exxon and Hess and all the others as well. And they are accusing the oil industry of colluding with OPEC which is based in Vienna, in Austria, as you know. Now, this follows a Federal Trade Commission report which scrutinizes the activities of a Texas oil tycoon, just like J.R. used to be all those years ago in Dallas. Now, this particular Texas oil tycoon says, look, this is 
allegations against me are nonsense. He's accused by the Democrats of working with OPEC to fix prices. He says, that's just nonsense, just leave me alone. However, the Democrats are wondering whether it actually stopped with this particular person, and whether it actually went further in the whole big oil industry, whether they were all colluding with OPEC to fix prices, which is a pretty serious allegation. Democrats demanding dates, times, meetings, and call logs, and this is not the last you'll hear of that story. Guys? Thanks, John. That is our correspondent, John Terrett, in New York. The personal details of over half a billion people could have been compromised following a security breach on the ticketing website Ticketmaster. Australia's investigating claims the site was targeted by professional hacking group Shiny Hunters. It's believed to have been behind a string of other high-profile attacks. This follows the U.S. Department of Justice beginning an antitrust lawsuit into Ticketmaster, accusing it and its owner, concert promoter Live Nation, of monopolizing the market. Joining me now is Graham Stewart, head of UK public sector at Checkpoint Software. Graham, not a great week for Ticketmaster, but let's focus on this data breach. For the consumer, 560 million of them worldwide. The breach apparently leaked full names and addresses and part credit card details. How, how damaging could that be for individuals? How could that info be used? Well, the, the, the way to think of this is in terms of quantity versus quality. So what you have here, it, if I had your email address, I could send you an annoying email. If I have your email address, your mobile phone number, your home address, then suddenly that uh, gives me scope for doing things that are far worse. So you then multiply that up by the volume, and all of a sudden this has, um, you know, quite a, a, a becomes very problematic to say the least. Um, and, and, you know, has implications for what someone could do, use that data for um, to actually go after these people again. Mm. We're seeing more and more of these breaches. And what I don't understand, Ticketmaster is an absolutely massive company. How is such a massive company with surely millions and millions to spend on data protection being made so vulnerable? And, 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 and the, the, I think the key way to, to, to think about this is... Um, it, there's been a lot of very large organizations all around the world that have, 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 have suffered a breach like this and have, have been hacked. And, and the way to think of it is, is these are very large organizations, very complex organizations, handling vast amounts of data. And typically, the failure comes from one of three places. People, process, technology. So typically, somebody somewhere has been tricked into doing something or has done something inadvertent, and that's been one of the causes. The process is that there's been a problem with governance, there's been a problem with the rules, that they've not actually been set properly or followed properly, and that's led to a problem. The other piece is technology. So if you think of this in terms of something like AI, AI was science fiction five years ago and is now commonplace, and we all talk about it and we all use it the whole time. Um, Cybersecurity is the same thing. It's moving at a very fast pace. So the defense technologies that you put in place, you need to stay on top of these things. So you really do need to have the best cybersecurity technology in place that you can and then adapt these to the organization to make sure you fend off these attacks. But very, very um, unusually would it be just one of those things. So there would this people process technology mm. is really cool. An organization gets it puts gets, the consumer uh, in a really difficult position because you go to a big online company feeling safe Ticketmaster you feel safe you're not dealing with some half known company what can you as an individual do even when doing online business with a big company that should be totally safe to protect yourself and your data so there's some general rules you need to apply the general rule you need to apply when do, dealing with anybody, someone big, someone small, on the internet, is you need to be suspicious, okay? So make sure you use strong passwords when you log into to websites. Don't reuse them, okay? So make sure you're using a strong password, a different one every single time. Use things like two-factor authentication. So when the, the, the banks, uh, when the website sends you a, a, a link to... Uh, send you a request for a, a text message on your mobile phone to authenticate the transaction. Make sure that's switched on. Really, really important. Something I do every day, look at your bank statements. Most of us have got banking apps now. Look at your bank statements and look for weird transactions, okay? Because 
and 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 that's the way you keep a, a track on these things so you know every, everyone uh, will see things coming through if you don't recognize the transaction phone the bank okay get in touch with them and 99 times out of 100 it's something that's been worded differently or but you'll you'll know be really cautious about any email that comes in with links that you, you don't like the look of, if the wording's strange, if the grammar's strange, be really suspicious, okay? Don't click on things. The other thing is when the website says, would you like to save your credit card details for a faster transaction next time? No, don't do that. Every time you make a transaction, you should be putting your card details in mm. every single time. Don't save your details. The minimum amount of information you can provide to organ an organization, and I'm not saying it's that, you know, that, that these are bad organizations, but protect yourself. Think of it in terms of how you would go shopping. You wouldn't leave your credit card with your supermarket and go, would you just hang on to this till I come in next time, please? <laughs> Be suspicious. Conduct, conduct business with an air of suspicion on the Internet. All right. Be suspicious. We got it. Important advice. Thank you very much. Graham Stewart, head of UK public sector at Checkpoint Software. Now, China will restrict exports of some aviation and aerospace-related equipment and technology from the start of July. The move aims to safeguard national security and interest. China says the new policies are not targeted at any specific country or region, but aims to stop those that may undermine its sovereignty and development interests. Toyota's global sales and production fell last month amid struggles in its largest market in China. Sales plummeted 27% due to fierce competition and price pressure, while in Japan they dropped 14%. Meanwhile, overall group sales fell 4.5%. Despite the setbacks, demand for hybrid vehicles boosted returns in European markets. British footwear brand Dr. Martens says it will make more than $30 million worth of savings after a sharp drop in profits. Sales were down by 12% in the last financial year, while pre-tax profits fell by 43%. The company said its poor performance is due to weak demand for its boots in the United States, which is its largest market. China has unveiled an action plan to cut carbon emissions in 2024 and 2025, aiming for a 1% drop in key industries. The government says China's economy will need 2.5% less energy for every unit of growth in 2024. The government also wants renewable energy sources to make up 20% of China's total usage in 2025, up from this year's target of nearly 19% there. So there will be a push to generate more clean energy so that by next year, nearly 40% of it should be renewable. That's up from nearly 34% in 2020. And China also wants to lift restrictions on the purchase of new energy vehicles, which will give a major boost to the EV industry. Laurie Mueller-Verter is a senior fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute and a lead analyst at the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air. Laurie, great to see you there. Welcome to our show. So China plans to reduce its carbon emissions by, um, in the key industries by about 1%. How significant is that? I think this plan as a whole, as a signal, is, is significant. China fell behind its climate commitments during the zero COVID period because of a lot of um, economic growth coming from energy intensive industries. And, and now this extraordinary plan is a signal that uh, the country will try to get back on track during the last two years of the five year plan period. The okay. industrial targets are, um, are going to be reached through two different ways. So there are things like recycling metal, um, more, more recycling, which is, which is very good. Um, there's also a lot of replacement of older industrial capacity happening, and that's a bit of a double-edged sword because uh, you have uh, um, old uh, energy-intensive industry uh, replaced with new new units, and, and that can, um, can be problematic for the overall emission reduction uh, plan. 
Uh, just a reminder for our viewers, China's goal is to peak its carbon emissions by 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. So by reducing that by 1% this year, which industries do you think will face the most significant challenges in improving their efficiency? Um, China has a very uh, long track record of, of improving um, energy um, efficiency in industry. Um, a lot of people have an idea of, of outdated um, uh, plants, but uh, but uh, that's not true anymore. Um, so, in terms of heavy industry, I think China is very very well placed to deliver these targets. The steel industry, in particular, has a very high potential for emission reductions because. There's a lot more scrap steel becoming available that can be recycled instead of making primary uh, steel. The sector that will, will probably be, uh, face the biggest challenge is buildings. Um, it's one with, with huge energy um, efficiency potential, but one where progress to date has been uh, a bit underwhelming. China's plan aims for a 2.5% reduction in energy usage per unit of GDP growth this year. What does it mean and how realistic do you think that is? Um, so China's target for the whole um, five-year period, meeting that would require an even larger reduction in energy intensity. China has also um, changed energy intensity to exclude clean energy, which is growing very fast right now. So this tar target should be easy to reach. The target of reducing carbon intensity by 3.9% uh, is the more challenging one. And that would mean slowing down China's CO2 emission growth from 5% last year um, to 1% uh, um, or less um, this year. So, so that's progress. Thank you very much. That is Laurie Mueller-Verter, Senior Fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute. Thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. The first heat-related death has been recorded in the Indian capital, New Delhi. A 40-year-old labourer died of heat stroke. Temperatures hit a record high of over 52 degrees Celsius as the extreme heat wave continues to sweep through the country. Our correspondent, Ravinda Bawa, reports from Delhi. Delhiites are facing one of the worst summer this year. Delhi and many parts of northwestern India are experiencing severe heat wave. Rain deficit is supposed to be one of the reasons for this kind of a heat buildup. And here at India Gate, which is one of the most popular destinations, we still see tourists here. They are well clad to handle this kind of heat. They are hydrated. They are keeping themselves hydrated to handle this kind of heat in order to prevent any kind of a heat stroke because the government has issued advisory saying exposure to this kind of a you know sun and heat would lead to heat related illnesses let's talk to some of them and find out how they are handling the situation I'm from Pune part of Maharashtra and it is like uh, too much cold there we have never experienced this kind of heat in our life so we are drinking water and coconut water to keep ourselves hydrated we were expecting to be here for a vacation just to enjoy but it was so hot we couldn't even spend time outside we're like trying to cope up as much as possible but again, we're drinking so much water, uh, all these stuffs. Vacation is not like going as well as it's supposed to be. In most places, maximum temperatures are 5 to 10 degrees Celsius above normal. Wednesday was the fourth consecutive day when a temperature was well above 45 degrees Celsius in Delhi. Heat wave conditions will continue to prevail on Thursday as well. However, some relief is expected on Friday as the weather department has predicted a partly cloudy sky with very light rain or drizzle accompanied by gusty winds. According to the National Center for Diseases Control, about 60 heat-related deaths have been recorded in India since 1st of March. The good news is that the monsoon has hit the southern state of Kerala and will be moving northwards. But the Med Department says that North Indians will have to deal with heat for the month of June as well. Ravinder Baba, CGTN, Delhi. But there is lots of excitement in Madrid today as the public can finally get to know the new neighbours, two giant pandas. Yeah, after weeks of getting used to the Spanish sun and local bamboo, they are ready to meet their public. Let's go live to Madrid and join our correspondent, Ken Brown. Hello, Ken. So have you had a look at the pandas? 
Yeah, hi Sally. Madrid has two new fur babies, the favorite residents. They've just uh, arrived, as you mentioned, a month ago. Now, you can forget Taylor Swift, who's packing out Real Madrid Stadium tonight. Last night, too, the real celebrity stardust was here with Jingxi and Ju, Madrid's new Chinese giant pandas. It's a bit hot today, so they're inside this building just here behind me, where people have been going past all day long. As I mentioned, they arrived a month ago on a private jet. They had a motorcycle cavalcade take them to the zoo. They also uh, had a royal welcome today. They met Queen Sophia, who's been involved in conservation and with this panda exchange program for around 40 years now. Today we also had the ambassador, the Chinese ambassador to Spain, Yao Jing, spoke, and uh, the pandas looked extremely happy here, munching on a load of bamboo and looked extremely comfortable getting in the sun in their enclosure here next to us. Here's a little bit more about what happened today. Madrid's new Chinese giant panda pair Jingxi and Ju are making themselves at home. Today is their debut day with the public and Spain's Queen Sofia formally greeting Madrid Zoo's new main attractions, who, according to the plan, will live here in Spain's capital until at least 2034. China's ambassador to Spain, Yao Jing, said that Queen Sophia helped this relationship grow when the Giant Panda Exchange program began after a visit from her and King Juan Carlos in the 1970s. So the importance is that this is the symbol of the friendship between China and Spain. This is the symbol of our connection, very close connection between the peoples of the two nations and the two countries. Jingxi and Ju traveled all the way from the Giant Panda Research Center in Chengdu with Chinese handlers staying in Madrid to help them settle in. But it looks like they don't need too much help. They are doing really well. The adaptation has been perfect. They are eating a lot. They increase their weight and they seem that they are really happy here. Jingxi and Ju have a lot to live up to. Tears were shed here at Madrid Zoo when previous couple Hua Zueba and Bingxing left. They bred successfully, having six cubs here in Madrid, including superstar twins Yo-Yo and Jojo. This is part of global efforts towards giant panda conservation. This giant panda pair have years yet to help numbers grow worldwide, but for now, it's time to relax, bask in the Spanish sunshine and the adoration of the public with their favorite Spanish variety giant. of bamboo. Numbers are uh, rising, Chinese giant panda numbers are rising in the wild. They went from 1,100 in the 1980s to around 2,000 now with some 700 in zoos around the, the world. I was going to give you some uh, panda puns, but I think you'd find them a little unbearable, Jiehua and Sally. <laughs> Enough already. Go and look at those pandas again. Thank you very much, uh, Ken Brown in Madrid. Let's just remind you of your top stories today. China's president urges deeper cooperation with Arab countries and calls for an end to the conflict in Gaza as he opens the China-Arab States Cooperation Forum in Beijing. Less growth than previously thought as first quarter US GDP figures were revised down. China unveils a plan to reduce carbon emissions with a major push towards more renewable energy sources. And that is for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all our stories at europe.cgtn.com. Do follow CGTN Europe on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. And you can go to CGTN Europe's channel on the Telegram app or scan the QR code on the screen to get stories and updates sent direct to your phone. Coming up next on CGTN Africa Live, see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. Now from all the team in London, goodbye. Yes.